Chief Executive, the Honorable Si Wai Long. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Jack So, Senior Advisor, Credit Suisse, Greater China. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, the Honorable Si Wai Long. Si Wai actually needs a little introduction. He was educated in Hong Kong and the UK and is a professional assessor. And he was a member of the Basic Law Drafting Committee and previously also convener of the Executive Council. Since 2012, he has been Hong Kong Chief Executive, a job that even the late founding father of Singapore, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, says is impossibly difficult. And he himself would not even think of taking on. However, since taking on the post, CY soldiers on, tackling problems, and making progress. He must go down on record as a leader who has solved one of the longest protest movements peacefully and without bloodshed. Of course, I'm referring to the Occupy Central last year. However, although the movement has ended, it has thrown up a few more problems to add to the list of problems that CY has to deal with. And I will leave it to him to talk about how he would deal with those problems. But to me, all the problems can be summarized perhaps under two themes. How to further enhance social harmony in Hong Kong and how to upgrade our economy to make ourselves more relevant to, to China's vision and ambitions. And these two themes are well summed up in his talk today, Hong Kong, a bright future as a super connector to the world. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Si Wai Long. Jack, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for this opportunity again to share my thoughts on Hong Kong and its future, your future, our future. For even if you are not from Hong Kong, we plan to be part of your future if you are not already. Future doesn't just happen, we make it happen. The future is built on the foundations of our past, on what we are laying right now. It's the vision behind our plans, programs, or policies, the creativity and innovation of our businesses, the sum total of the setbacks, triumphs, and determination in each and every one of us. So to understand Hong Kong's tomorrow, we must first look at our past and the present, what we went through, where we are, and what we are facing. From there, we can consider where we want to go and how we plan to get there. Hong Kong is a well-researched subject. Numerous articles, books, and papers have been written since the 1980s about, for example, displacement by Singapore, and then around at the turn of the century by Shanghai. Before 1997, the final demise of Hong Kong was predicted. Many went on record to say that no matter how many other systems were we have in one country, we could not have, for example, a separate legal and judicial system from those on the mainland. Milton Friedman weighed in to say that there could not be two currencies coexisting in one country. A book appeared in 1995 with the title, Who Will Feed China? Warning about food shortage in the country. And just imagine the prospects for Hong Kong if we had over one billion hungry people at our doorstep. All these and many other subjects about Hong Kong are now history. Against the many books written about Hong Kong's future, none has been written about the resilience of Hong Kong and why all the worrying predictions were wide off the mark. It is a fact that Hong Kong dollar has been alive and well since 1997. It is a fact that we have maintained a separate legal system and a robust judicial system 
that is not only separate from the mainlands, but also independent of the executive authorities of Hong Kong. We now realize that China is big enough to require both Shanghai and Hong Kong, and Asia is big enough to have both Singapore and Hong Kong. And the Chinese people on the mainland have enough money, after paying for their food, to come to Hong Kong to shop for branded goods, and the list could go on. Hong Kong remains highly relevant to China. If one is allowed to be immodest, one would definitely say that we have a key role to play in the country's reforms, the ongoing reforms. At the same time, the mainland of China is our biggest and most important partner in many ways. Investments by Hong Kong companies on the mainland now cover virtually all the sectors. We are now in mining, dairy farming, horticulture, education services, petrochemical, pharmaceutical, as well as the usual real estate and professional and obviously financial services. We also have all the corners of this vast country covered. Everywhere we go, from the remote northeast to the equally remote south southwest, we come across Hong Kong residents and Hong Kong businesses. Professional services is one of our fastest growing sectors on the mainland. It is estimated that 70%, some zero, of fees earned by Hong Kong-based architects are from the mainland. Let's put aside the dollars and cents for the time being and look at one aspect of social integration between Hong Kong and the mainland of China. Over the past few years, about one third of all marriages registered at the Hong Kong registry were between Hong Kong residents and mainland residents. It's about one third. Now, this government has been accused from time to time of getting too close to the mainland, but I can assure you that we do not provide dating services. <laughs> and it just happened between Hong Kong and the mainland. Of course, we have our fair share of challenges to contend with. And some of these challenges come with opportunities of historic proportions. Let me briefly mention two. One is the move to change the method of electing the next chief executive to universal suffrage. To do so, the change has to be passed by two thirds majority of the members of legislative council. It has to receive the consent of the chief executive and finally, the approval of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. The change to universal suffrage is provided for in the basic law, which says, I quote, the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures, unquote. I should also mention that whatever the election method, the chief executive shall be appointed by the central people's government. This substantive, and it's not ceremonial, appointment is necessary and is stated in the basic law since the central people's government devolves additional powers to the chief executive of Hong Kong so that Hong Kong has a high degree of autonomy, higher, much higher than the autonomy that other local governments in China and outside of China have. I have publicly committed to universal suffrage in 2017. So has the National People's Congress. If we can secure two thirds majority in Let's Go, we can make history here and now. We can choose our next chief executive by universal suffrage, one person, one vote, for the first time ever in Hong Kong's history. For <clears throat> 79 days last year, certain main roads in Hong Kong were occupied. The occupies, occupiers wanted a genuine democracy and more particularly civic nomination rather than nomination by the nominated committee, as stated in the basic law. In the end, two things prevailed. One is the rule of law and the other public opinion. There was no serious casualty. Injunctions against the occupiers were obtained from the courts. The bailiffs executed court orders with the help of the police. The government showed restraints. The public 
began to lose patience over the Occupy movement. There were serious prospects of the Democrats who were behind or supporting the Occupy movement being punished at the elections later this year and next year. So the movement, in the end, burned itself out. The following figures say something about the movement. On 2nd July last year, 511 people were arrested on Chater Road Central for staging the so-called rehearsal of the Occupy Central movement. Five months later, when the real movement took place, on the 11th of December at the main Occupy site in Admiralty, when the police moved in to clear and reopen the roads, only 249 were left to be arrested. So 249 on the 11th of December versus 511 on the rehearsal day. <clears throat> Thousands chose to leave voluntarily the night before and on that morning when the police moved in. I should also mention one other point. Throughout the Occupy movement, the handling of the incident was left entirely to the Hong Kong police. The Hong Kong garrison of the Chinese People's Liberation Army was never called out from their barracks. It was a reassuring sign on the part of the central government of the faith and confidence in the Hong Kong government and its police force. Will Occupy Rexrect itself? The Hong Kong government, as always, maintains its preparedness. But I can say that the public, if Occupy happens again, will not be sympathetic. There's also the economy, or more to the point, there's a world economy to consider. The Chinese government trimmed this target for economic growth this year to about 7%. Recovery of the economies of the US and Europe is by no means certain. Given that Hong Kong's economy is significantly tied to the world's, in last month's budget, the Financial Secretary forecasts that Hong Kong's GDP would grow in the coming year anywhere from 1% to 3% this fiscal year. That wide range reflects uncertainties. If the 2015-16 budget offers reason for caution, it also underscores Hong Kong's strengths. That includes our sound fiscal position. Our fiscal reserves are now equal to about 20 months of government expenditure. For the fiscal year ending next Tuesday, we expect a record high profits tax receipt. Our salaries tax receipt is also significantly higher than the original estimate. So thank you to all those who pay these taxes. And we can invest, and invest substantially, in the people of Hong Kong and in their livelihood. In the five years since 2010-2011, total government expenditure and recurrent expenditure will have soared by over 45%. But we still had a big surplus last year. Education, social welfare, and health alone account for 60% of our recurrent expenditure. Alleviating poverty is also a priority. We do have poverty in Hong Kong. Two years ago, we introduced the old age living allowance. To date, that supplement has benefited more than 410,000 elderly people in need. And thanks to this initiative, by the end of 2013, our poverty rate had dropped from 15% to 14.5% a milestone of a fight to reduce poverty, and a testimony to the endeavours of the government. Our strategy is to ensure that we have a reasonable and sustainable social security and welfare system in place for those in need. And no less important, that we encourage young people and adults to become self-reliant through employment. In that regard, both my policy address and the budget offers a number of initiatives and programs created to expand our talent pool in those areas where we just don't have sufficient local manpower or professional expertise. Infrastructure development, for example, is critical to our future, which is why our capital works expenditure has grown from $50 billion a year five years ago to some $70 billion this fiscal year, and will maintain at the current level in the next few years. 
Our annual overall construction expenditure, this covers both the public and private sectors, has reached $200 billion in 2014 and will remain at between $190 billion and $240 billion in the coming few years. The challenge is finding enough skilled manpower to meet our needs. In the policy address, I pledge $100 million to boost the construction industry's manpower training and related efforts. There are blanks too in the financial services sector. As the Financial Services Development Council noted in a recent report, Hong Kong needs more financial services professionals in mid- and back-office operations. We are now studying the Council's recommendations and will give them our serious consideration. The labour market remained tight in 2014. Last year, unemployment edged down to 3.2%. Total employment grew by 0.9%, reaching a new annual high. In short, Hong Kong people are making and spending good money. Grassroots workers have enjoyed particularly appreciable increases since statutory minimum wage took effect four years ago. Since then, average employment earnings of full-time employees in the lowest textile group rose 35%. And this is um, the extent of increase in four years. The lowest textile group in our workforce are now making 35% more than four years ago. Taking away inflation, the figure is 13%. The professional and business services and financing and insurance sectors are also doing well. They saw robust payroll growth of some 7% year on year in the first three quarters of 2014. Housing and land was, is, and may well remain one of our continuing challenges. But here too, we are making progress. Last December, my government adopted a long-term housing strategy. This was the first long-term housing strategy document since 1998. I'll leave the details for another time, but based on demand projections, suffice to say that our housing supply target for the coming 10 years is 480,000 units. And that's a daunting number, to be sure, but one we must achieve for the people of Hong Kong. Supplying prime commercial space and land to sustain Hong Kong's economic growth is no less essential. In this respect, let me briefly touch on two areas of great promise for the future of Hong Kong, Kowloon East and East Lantau. Kowloon East is being developed as an alternative core business district, injecting an additional 5 million square meters. Yes, it is square meters, 5 million square meters. So it's more than 50 million square feet of commercial and office floor area into Hong Kong's stock. Further down the development road, there's this land tower with a staggering potential for Hong Kong's economic growth. Indeed, we see it as a third central business district featuring office, hotel, and related commercial developments while rising as a new population center. That covers a lot of ground, including our long-term needs for housing as well as social and economic development. East Lantau will evolve alongside the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, which is one of the longest in the world of its kind. The bridge will connect Hong Kong to the prosperous Western Pearl River Delta of Guangdong. These and other infrastructure and logistical developments will strengthen Hong Kong's role as a super connector between the mainland of China and the rest of the world. This role has just started to grow. It is underpinned by the one country, two systems arrangement, which allows us to enjoy the benefits of being part of China while retaining our singular strengths. When you are in Hong Kong, you are in China. But then Hong Kong is not just any Chinese city because we practice the other system that provides us with distinct advantages compared to other cities in the country. While exploring the enormous Chinese market, you can operate your business in China through Hong Kong. We are well known for our world-class infrastructure, low and simple tax regime, robust banking and financial system, 
an abundant supply of highly skilled professionals, free flow of information, good corporate governance, independent judiciary, and rule of law. More importantly, when you operate your business in Hong Kong, you do not compete with government-owned or government-linked enterprises. Unless, of course, you want to compete with Disneyland in Lantau, which we own, or the Mass Transit Railway, which we also own. And these are the only two enterprises that government partly owns. We are the super connector because we understand both the mainland and global interests. This understanding has been our core competence for more than a century. We understand both the mainland and global interests. We are the super connector also because we have open minds and a welcoming attitude to foreign businesses whom we see as partners more than competitors. This understanding attitude make us, among other things, Asia's business hub, where the business world wants to be. And of course, it has conveniently made us the chief information officer and chief knowledge officer of China. The successful preservation of the Hong Kong dollar as our legal tender since 1997, alongside renminbi on the mainland, has given us an unexpected connector advantage. Hong Kong is now the world's hub for offshore renminbi business. Hong Kong banks today handle some 70% of global renminbi payments. At the end of January, Hong Kong's renminbi deposits and outstanding renminbi certificates of deposits were worth more than 1.1 trillion renminbi, about 60% of the offshore pool of renminbi liquidity. Renminbi trade settlement managed by Hong Kong banks last year came in at 6.3 trillion renminbi a jump of 60%, 60 over the previous year. About 500 renminbi bond insurance, insur issuances were arranged for in Hong Kong between 2007 and February of this year. Together, they were worth more than 370 billion renminbi. In the last quarter of 2014, average daily turnover from our real-time growth settlement system totaled 850 billion renminbi. That's 80% increase year on year. Our super connector role continues to bring us fresh opportunities. The Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, which was launched last November, was a recent example, which also assists in the opening up of the mainland's capital market, as well as the internationalization of the renminbi as a currency for global investment. A similar scheme, the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, is now in the works, and that underlines the other developments connecting Hong Kong with southern China. After the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, the central government is creating similar pilot free trade zones in Guangdong, which is right next door, Fujian, and Tianjin. The Guangdong Free Trade Zone will embrace Hengqian, Nansa, and Qianhai. Each of these areas will no doubt create new opportunities for Hong Kong. In turn, Hong Kong, thanks to its super connector role, will enable global business to take advantage of southern China's rising business tide. The economies of ASEAN are also central to our future. Indeed, ASEAN is a critical part of our business right now. It's our second largest trading partner behind only mainland China. It's also Hong Kong's seventh largest source of inward direct investment. Hong Kong is ASEAN's sixth largest source. ASEAN's combined population of more than 600 million is about 100 million more than that of the European Union. ASEAN's workforce is young, its population aspiring, and the region's needs for wide-ranging infrastructure and business services great and growing. It's with this in mind that we are in the midst of completing a free trade agreement with ASEAN's 10 member states. Successful completion of the pact will mark the beginning of new era for Hong Kong ASEAN cooperation. More opportunity for Hong Kong trade and businesses. More prospects for all of you here today. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the future of Hong Kong is not described in 20 minutes. The basic message is simple, that this government is proactively planning for and shaping the future. Again, if I'm allowed to be immodest, I would carry on to say that Hong Kong is working with the rest of the country to shape the country's future. All in all, we are, in countless ways and means, working toward a tomorrow that will reward us all, the community of Hong Kong, as well as the country, the people of Hong Kong, as well as its businesses. Thank you. Why? thank you very much for an uh, excellent speech and thank you for staying behind to have a discussion with the audience. Maybe uh, while the audience is thinking of the questions, uh, let me ask the first one. I'm sure there are many things on your mind because uh, many problems still waiting to be resolved. Housing shortage, uh, education and upward mobility of the young, bridging the gap between rich and poor, upgrading Hong Kong's economy, uh, building infrastructure, including the third runway, which is very close to my heart. So what are your priorities and how do you propose to uh, deal with these problems in the face of a, should I say, obstructive legislative council? The short answer is, for those of you who are registered voters, vote them out next year. <laughs> the election will take place Electrical election will take place um, sometime in the third quarter of next year. Go to a polling station, vote them out. A handful of electrical members have been filibustering. They are delaying, for example, the implementation of infrastructure, infrastructural uh, projects, which we need, which we have budgeted for, which will do great things to the economy and to society. Uh, we need two thirds. Sorry, come again. We need to have majority in both sides of the house, functional constituency, geographical, geographical constituency, to move a motion to change the rules and procedures of LegCo so that we do not have filibustering. Um, the uh, debate on the appropriation bill, which is part of the budgeting process, will start very soon in LegCo and can watch uh, what filibustering does to Hong Kong. Um, on the question of um, the, um, the key agenda items on government's agenda, for the past um, uh, two and a half years, uh, and, and this is very much uh, in keeping uh, with my pledge uh, in the uh, election manifesto, there are four uh, main focus areas. Housing, poverty, and again, we do have poverty in Hong Kong, um, and the environment, and aging society. Aging society brings um, a number of challenges in a number of policy areas. Uh, healthcare, uh, housing for the aged is a different kind of housing. Um, transportation, um, generally paying for uh, retirement, and so, and so on. So these are the four uh, key areas. Obviously, we're not saying that education is not important. We're not saying that healthcare is, is not important. Uh, but we need to uh, focus on, um, on the main areas, uh, the main challenges that Hong Kong faces. Okay. Any questions and comments from the floor? Gentleman over there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lun. Uh, to the investor, I think Hong Kong is going through a very interesting phenomenon right now. Uh, we have a motherland which is slowing down right now, but we have potential in, in interest rate hike. So our currency in the last 12 months is 20% more expensive to our tourism. So it makes perfect sense for people to think about the review on the currency pack. At the same time, we all understand there's a larger agenda called RMB internationalization. So to the Hong Kong issue, 
as a chief executive, how you balance between Hong Kong issue together with a bigger agenda at your back on the national level. So what was your experience and what will be your strategy going forward? Thank you. Uh, firstly, on the, on the question of the PEG, um, <clears throat> I'll say it again, loud and clear. We do not change the PEG. We do not have any plan at all uh, to do anything to the PEG. Uh, as major um, currencies in the world move up and down, uh, we get um, uh, different challenges. Uh, but by and large, and over time, the PEC has served Hong Kong well. So we are not doing anything uh, about the PEC. Uh, on the question of balancing uh, local issues and national issues, by and large, there are so many uh, mutually uh, rewarding subjects on our agenda. It's just a question of uh, implementation. Uh, for example, the free trade zones that I, that I mentioned in Hangjian, Nancha, and Tianhai. Uh, 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 we are taking um, an active part, and in fact, a, a proactive part, uh, to make sure that development of these free trade uh, zones, particularly the, 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 the zone in uh, Nansa, will benefit not just Guangdong, but also uh, Hong Kong. So there are many such um, uh, issues. I'm not, I'm not worried uh, at all about the prospect that we have. It is a question of um, overcoming uh, obstacles. Uh, some of these are in our political structure. Uh, Philip Bustring in uh, Let's Go, for example, is a key one. Any more questions? Can I ask another one, uh, CY? China has uh, proposed this very uh, imaginative and uh, far reaching uh, proposal of one belt, one road uh, development for the next decade. <clears throat> How is Hong Kong going to fit into this uh, development, and what is our role uh, in? the near future? Um, we are plunging in. Uh, we are having discussions with central authorities. We are also having discussions with um, our international partners as to uh, what Hong Kong can do. Already we have identified a number of areas. Uh, maritime services, for example. Um, <clears throat> other uh, services, financial services, um, uh, other professional services, are probably very um, obvious. But maritime services is something they want to focus on uh, too. Uh, so much so that we are in the process of setting up a maritime authority. Um, and you probably read about um, uh, or read the announcements of the establishment of this uh, authority um, pretty soon. Um, there is a key sentence in the uh, 12 five year plan which is coming to an end, and we're in the process of um, uh, mapping out the 13th, or the Hong Kong part of the 13th uh, five-year national plan with uh, the central authorities. In the 12th five-year plan, uh, the sentence goes something like this. I'm translating in my head as I speak. Um, to support Hong Kong uh, to consolidate and enhance its role as an international financial trade and transportation center. Um, and by transportation, one means both shipping and civil aviation. Uh, consolidation means to me uh, keeping what we have um, and don't lose it. Enhancement means doing something smarter, move up the value chain. Um, and that to me means instead of moving container, container boxes around, for example, <clears throat> or having more container terminals, uh, move into the maritime services space and do things such as maritime legal services, insurance, uh, financial services, dispute resolution, and, and so on. Uh, these are sectors that we, uh, have fo that we are focusing on. Uh, and, and this will tie in very well with the One Belt, One Road um, initiative on the part of the country. Questions? Gentlemen? I see why. Thank you for your time. Um, with the passing of Lee Kuan Yew uh, this week, uh, I wanted to, maybe this is a good time for us to reflect on Singapore and the many roles it serves vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong. You mentioned earlier as a potential competitor, as a co-leader for Asia, and perhaps as a role model, both on the economic and governance front. So I just want to get your thoughts on 
No, not quite what Singapore did right or wrong, <clears throat> but how do you reflect on Singapore as a role model uh, on governance and other issues? Uh, firstly, on the, um, on the question of relations between Hong Kong and Singapore, um, I never uh, uh, believe in the theory that Hong Kong and Singapore compete against each other um, in a sort of negative sense of the word. Um, competition could be healthy. And I actually challenge this um, notion to the point of um, uh, accepting invitations to sit on three Tamasat linked uh, boards. And I served on these boards um, for many years until I decided to resign from all uh, boards, Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, to run the election three years ago. Uh, the two cities are well spaced apart. Flight time is three hours, 45 minutes. And that's a long way. Both cities are small enough for us to have to eat each other. Both cities have big enough hinterlands. Singapore has the ASEAN countries, and we have the mainland of China. Um, and I see more opportunities for uh, collaboration uh, between us. So that's the, um, my view on the relations between the two um, cities. Uh, Singapore is a model uh, for Hong Kong. Yes, there are many areas where we could compare notes on. Uh, but the two uh, cities are very, very differently structured, and we have very different histories. We have different peoples. Um, and therefore, I wouldn't just um, uh, tear out the leaf of uh, Singapore's history and try to uh, plant it uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, we have our own challenges and opportunities, uh, likewise, Singapore. And they have their own solutions, and likewise, uh, Hong Kong. Question? Yeah, Mr. Long, you mentioned uh, uh, the housing being one of your key focuses, and your government has done a lot uh, <coughs> to, to try and uh, uh, facilitate uh, the more affordable housing. Yet, has it really worked? Is there any additional uh, measures that you're planning in the foreseeable future? Um, we, are, we are working on the supply side. We are also <coughs> watching the uh, demand side. As you probably know, on the demand side, we have managed to manage down, and in some cases, uh, manage out altogether um, three types of um, demand, uh, which in our view should take a uh, lower uh, preference compared to occupational demand. These three types of demand that we are managing down, and we have managed down, uh, in some uh, cases managed out, <coughs> are speculative demand, investment demand, and external uh, demand. Uh, we are watching uh, the situation and we do, we do not rule out the possibility of having to uh, carry out um, other or additional demand management measures if uh, prices continue to run away. Um, on the supply side, uh, we are um, doing a lot. We have a 30-year plan. Uh, obviously, we need to produce 480,000 uh, in the next uh, 10 years. We expect to hand over the first key uh, to an apartment in a public housing estate in Northeast New Territories, for example, in about nine years. Um, it's a big project, um, and it's a good quality uh, project. It's going to be the best quality new town. It's a new generation new town that we're building. Uh, low density and um, good, infrastru good infrastructure, uh, a high percentage of open space and greenery in the northern part of uh, the New Territories. So that's um, medium term. Long term, we're looking at, for example, reclamation. Um, uh, we have a ambitious and ambitious reclamation project somewhere between uh, Lantau Island and uh, Hong Kong Island. Uh, we have a population target of nearly a million people uh, for Lantau and this uh, reclamation project. So supply side is important too. We need to break the backbone of the housing problem uh, by making supply happen. Question, gentleman in the back. CY, uh, thank you for your comments. Um, just a quick question about the environment. I know that there's been, um, you know, there have been measures um, that have been put in place by the government, but we still continue to have days of uh, record uh, pollution. 
Um, can you give us a sense of what the future holds in terms of what measures and when we will actually see a material difference, you know, in the uh, uh, pollution in the environment? Um, we are doing a lot uh, in the, we, or we have done a lot in the last uh, two and a half years since I, to, um, I took office um, on the environment side, uh, particularly improving air quality in Hong Kong. We are replacing pre-Euro 4 uh, uh, fleet of uh, 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 goods vehicles in Hong Kong uh, by uh, offering pretty handsome subsidies to lorry owners, and that already uh, is happening. Um, the replacement is already happening. Um, air quality, generally speaking, is improving. NO2, SO2 uh, levels are coming down. Uh, and we are the first Asian city or first Asian port that requires um, ships at birth to use uh, uh, clean fuel while they're at birth. Um, so these are some of the measures that we have um, uh, implemented. And we um, expect air quality to continue to improve in the next few years. See, well, can I ask you a question about the conflict between mainland Chinese tourists and some local <coughs> residents? Uh, as we know, some scuffles uh, happened in certain uh, locations. Although from a very small minority of local residents, nonetheless gave Hong Kong a very bad image on the social media, on television, and so on. What would be the way forward to resolve this conflict and to uh, recover or change uh, Hong Kong's image as a welcoming center for tourists from every direction? Thank you. Um, managing the interface between Hong Kong and the mainland uh, is never easy. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a series of articles on what I call internal diplomacy. And this is the di diplomacy between Hong Kong and the rest of the country. And many aspects of internal diplomacy is like external uh, diplomacy. I even sort of coined a, a, um, a, a Chinese term for this, uh, jiao and uh, It's complex. It's a very rich interface. There are many, many issues. Um, as I said, social integration between Hong Kong and the mainland is happening at a pretty fast way. Uh, not many people in Hong Kong or um, on the mainland of China realize that about one third of our marriages registered in Hong Kong are between Hong Kong and mainland residents. Um, so things are happening pretty, pretty fast. Um, tourism is one of our important sectors. It contributes about 4.7% uh, to our GDP. More importantly, GDP contribution on its own is not that um, uh, important. Uh, professional services also contribute 4.7% uh, to our GDP. Um, more importantly, tourism provides a large number of jobs, uh, particularly to the low-skill or non-skill uh, workers um, in Hong Kong. And so that has a, um, a, a social dimension uh, to it in terms of uh, importance. Um, but we need to um, address the question of capacity in Hong Kong as well. And the number of retail outlets we have, um, how wide is our pavement in some of these uh, neighborhoods, and how many eateries are there in the northern part of uh, the, um, the new territories, uh, when both uh, visitors and uh, local people, including school children and white collar workers, queue up for their lunch boxes. How many eateries do we have? The question of public transportation, are they being crowded out by visitors? And these are issues that we need to look at too. And we need to balance the needs of the visitors and the local people. And when there isn't enough resource, whatever the resource is, to go around, I've said this many times, I've said it here this morning again, Hong Kong people come first. And that's why uh, I eliminated the quota uh, for mainland uh, pregnant uh, women coming to Hong Kong to give birth uh, as soon as, as uh, I was elected. Uh, that's why, uh, as I said, we have um, a stamp duty um, arrangement to discourage external demand, and much of the external demand was made up by demand uh, from uh, mainland residents to buy residential properties in Hong Kong. Um, so we need to uh, strike a balance 
uh, between uh, tourism uh, as, a, as an economic sector, as a source of employment, important, and uh, the um, general orderliness and also livelihood of the people in the districts affected. Questions, comments? Well, if not, then uh, I think uh, we are very grateful to see why you know how busy you are in your daily schedule. Thank you for coming to give us Thank a you. good speech and also have this discussion with the audience. Thank you very Thank much. You.